On Ash Wednesday, we began our Lenten journey around the theme, Living the Sabbath, by talking about grace and how we need to open our hearts and our hands if we are going to receive, experience God's grace. In our second service, Tim Owings invited us to live the Sabbath by sitting down by stopping our work and our busyness so that we might be fed by the Lord. The third week, we were invited to know the freedom of the Lord by laying down any and all burdens which prevent us from being the children of God that we are created to be. We next considered how living the Sabbath introduces us to a life of gratitude, We might be grateful every moment, for we know that it could have been otherwise. Two weeks ago, we took a final step in living the Sabbath with practices of delight as we paused to truly taste and see the goodness of the Lord. Tonight, we circle back to the beginning and hear God's promise of not just rest, but eternal rest. So let us hear a final vision from the God, Revelation to John, chapter 22, verses 1 through 7. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him, and they will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. They need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, And they will reign forever and ever. And he said to me, these words are trustworthy and true. For the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. See, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. On several occasions through the years, I have participated in a special Monday, Thursday service, which attempted to recreate a Passover meal as Jesus might have celebrated it with his disciples in the upper room. So we gathered around tables, we lit the Passover candles, we followed the liturgy and the prayers, we heard the traditional Passover questions from the children, we ate authentic Passover food. We then transitioned into a celebration of the Lord's Supper and hearing Jesus' departing words to his disciples from the Gospel of John. It's a powerful service for me, as all Monday, Thursday services are. But what struck me most, though, was about how remembering the Passover and the Exodus, that look back to the past, continually pointed God's people toward a promised future. Thus, we ended the service with these words. The story of redemption is not ended. We celebrate what God has done in our history and what he has done for us. But at the same time, we still await a new future. All creation still groans and longs for its final redemption. As Jesus left, he promised that he would come again and restore all things. 
We have faith to believe that God will not leave the world the way it is. So we await the day in which he will come again and bring his kingdom in fullness. That's the promise in which we gather here together tonight. For this evening, we too await with hope the day in which Christ will come again and bring his kingdom in fullness. For as we just heard in the text tonight, the revelation to John, Jesus has promised that he is coming and that he is coming soon. We see a vision of what that kingdom in its fullness will be like. There's this river of life. It is crystal clear, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. No longer anything hiding beneath the surface of murky water. This river nourishes the tree of life, which produces food year round. In the midst of a world of pain and division and toil and perceived scarcity, this is a glorious vision of provision and peace. And when the kingdom comes, there will be no more night. No more night. Do you remember that in the beginning, way back in Genesis, as God calls forth creation, there is evening and there is morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. And the third day and the fourth day, the fifth and the sixth days, there was evening and there was morning. This pattern of evening and morning leads to a weekly pattern of Sabbath on the seventh day. Six days you shall toil and work, and on the seventh day you shall rest. But in this vision from Revelation, there is no more night. For the Lord God dwells among his people as their eternal light. Thus, the repeatable pattern of evening and morning will be broken with an eternal day of rest and release and freedom and thanksgiving and delight. As 4th century bishop and theologian Augustine of Hippo wrote, There shall be a great Sabbath which has no evening, which God celebrated among his first works. For we ourselves shall be the seventh day, when we shall be filled and replenished with God's blessing and sanctification, when we are restored by him and perfected with greater grace, we shall have eternal leisure to see that he is God, for we shall be full of him when he shall be all in all." Yes, as Augustine reads this text, the promise is that as the world to come, we ourselves will be the Sabbath as we rest eternally with God. Work and toil are ended in such a way that humanity is permanently released from its labor. Oh, this vision is such a far cry from the 24-7, 365 world in which we live today. This poet Wendell Berry has so poignantly written, the impulse of industrial life is limitless. Whatever we have in whatever quantity is not enough. There's no such thing as enough. Our bellies and our wallets must become oceanic and still they will not be full. Six work days in a week are not enough. We need a seventh. No, we need an eighth. In the industrial world at Climax, one family cannot or will not support itself by one job. We need one job for the day and one for the night. Thank God for the moon. We cannot stop to eat. Thank God for our cars. We dine as we drive over another paved farm. Everybody is weary, and there is no rest. My friends, the promise that Christ makes to us is nothing less in this vision of the future of the kingdom than Sabbath. 
And not just a day of rest each week. No eternal Sabbath, eternal rest. For we shall be full of him when he shall be all and all. While we await for the kingdom to come in all of its fullness, we can yet taste it even today. We gather around this table, this Lord's table, to meet our risen Lord who has promised to be with us always, even to the end of the age. Yes, we can meet Jesus here. So my friends, if you are longing to know him better, if your heart is crying out for the rest that only God can provide, then come. Come to this table. Pause and hear the choir sing this requiem, these prayers for eternal rest. And as you come this evening, after you have received bread and dipped it in the cup, I invite you to pick up one of the hearts that you'll find in the plates on either side of the sanctuary. For on that heart is a thumbprint and a smaller heart symbolizing that your heart already rests in the heart of God. You bear the divine thumbprint as a child of God, a brother or sister with Christ. For my friends, even as we wait this evening, there can be no doubt that the God who's coming loves you and me. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh God, we long for rest, for refreshment, for renewal, for the gifts that only you can provide. Help us to taste and see them as we gather at your table tonight. Knowing that this is the table of our crucified and yet risen Lord, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.